sear, chop, dice, crush, fold. There are so many vocabulary words, actions, verbs that we do in the kitchen cooking. Do you know how to fold in an ingredient? There's a hilarious scene from the show Shit's Creek where two people are following a recipe and neither of them know what fold in the cheese means. Next step is to fold in the cheese. What does that mean? What does fold in the cheese mean? He folds it in. I, I understand that, but how, how do you fold it? Do you fold it in half like a piece of paper and drop it in the pot or what do you do? So we'll cover that. We'll divide our verbs into four categories. Things you do with a knife, things that combine ingredients, things that change the shape of ingredients, what? And verbs that change the temperature of ingredients. First, verbs that use a knife or something sharp. Slice. To cut from a larger portion into a smaller, thinner size. I'll slice the cake. Here, the chef is slicing meat. I did this by slicing open the side of the chicken breast to allow it to open up. Did you notice how he made that a phrasal verb too? Slice open. And yes, you can say slice off, slice in, slice towards, slice under, and so on. The idea here is that you're creating smaller, narrower pieces. We also use slice as a noun all the time with pizza or cake. He's holding a slice of pizza. Sometimes we just say slice for this. Where's the best place to get a slice around here? Everyone would know that means a slice of pizza. Who is this guy, by the way? In today's video, we'll see clips from two different cooking channels here on YouTube with permission. This is Steven from Not Another Cooking Show, and this is Hyla from Hyla Cooking. Both great cooking channels. If you love food, go check them out and binge watch some videos. That's one of my favorite things to do. What's the difference between slice and cut? I think of slice as being more thin. You slice something into thin, uniform pieces like bread. We might use cut to get rid of something, to cut something off. Cut off the stems of the broccoli and just use the florets, for example. You can just cut it off. Cut off also works when you're saying something and someone else starts to talk over you before you finished. You could say, hey, you cut me off. In the kitchen, you might cut something up. Cut up the carrot into one inch chunks. As a noun, a cut up is someone who's trying to be funny, always making jokes. He's such a cut up. You can also cut in to something. I'm gonna take the drumette, bend the wing down, and cut in. Chop. When you cut with a repeated motion, not just one or two cuts, chopping requires a lot of up and down movement. I chopped the baby's food into tiny pieces for him. We would also use this for wood, like what you would do with an ax to get firewood. He chopped the logs into a huge stack of firewood. This one is also very common as a phrasal verb, like chop up. I actually don't notice a big difference in the usage of chop versus chop up when it comes to cooking. Both mean to make smaller pieces. Let's chop up some onion. There's definitely a hierarchy of size when we change the verb. Dice. Dice pieces are generally smaller than chopped pieces and minced pieces are even smaller than diced. So let's look at dice. If you play board games, you know that dice are six-sided cubes with a certain number of dots on each side. This is an example of where the noun comes from what you get by doing the verb. When you dice a potato, you get little cubes of it that look like dice. Now, if you wanted to dice it smaller, you would just cut thinner planks. Okay, largest to smallest, we have chopped, diced, minced. Mince. I am basically cutting the food into as tiny pieces as I can with a knife. Really strong aromatic flavors like garlic and herbs tend to be minced because getting a big chunk of a really strong flavor in your mouth is not all that great. Mincing helps these potent flavors get more evenly distributed throughout a dish. Of course, you're gonna hear it as a phrasal verb too, mince up. Okay, so I also minced up some garlic when you weren't looking. Last in this group, we have a verb that we probably use more in relation to hair than food, but even so, you will hear it. It's shave. 
It means to take off a thin layer. For foods that have a peel or skin or an outer layer of some kind, you might hear it used there. We're just gonna shave the rind off. Watermelon peel is really thick, so we call it a rind. Now, he could have said just as naturally, cut the rind off or slice off the rind. We have a lot of different verbs that we can use when it comes to using your knife. Now our second category, combining ingredients. Back to our original scene from Schitt's Creek when two people were trying to fold in cheese. When you fold paper, you can do truly amazing things with it. This is my friend Ben who is just amazing at origami. When you fold one ingredient into another, you're doing this to mix things without crushing. We do this with light ingredients, like some egg whites that you've whipped. So to fold something else into something, you put the light thing on top, and then with a spatula, you take what's underneath and put it on top, incorporating without crushing. Probably the most common instruction you'll see in a recipe is add, to put one thing with another thing and I'm gonna add my butternut squash to my broth. Mix is another high frequency verb when it comes to cooking. With mix, you add ingredients together and then agitate them with a spoon, spatula, maybe a stand mixer, so that the consistency becomes more uniform. So this is different than fold where we're being a lot more gentle. Mix, mix in, mix up, Wait, mix up also means to confuse things. A server at a restaurant might say, shoot, I put in the wrong order for the wrong table. I got mixed up. Mix in, mix together. So we're we just gonna mix this all together. Beat, this is to stir very quickly and with force. A pair of beaters on an electric mixer can combine wet and dry ingredients together really quickly. Again, the noun beater relates directly to the verb. A non-cooking use, you could say, we beat the team by two points. Beat means defeated or won against. It can also mean to hit someone or something with great force. And we use that a lot with up. He got beat up at school. But the idea of hitting food or applying energy to the motion of stirring comes through here. I always beat my eggs before cooking them. I stir them hard and fast. This incorporates air into them to make them fluffy. I'm gonna add salt to one of them and beat it, and the other. A word with a similar meaning is whisk. The object looks pretty similar to beaters, doesn't it? A whisk is good for creating light mixtures and batters. Now we'll learn some other words for stir. Everyone knows stir. Let's dig deeper for some synonyms. And you wanna just start moving it around, breaking it up move around. That's exactly what it sounds like. Not necessarily going in a circular motion, but poking and prodding ingredients here and there. Move the peppers around the pan so that they don't burn in one spot. Move them around. Or and you want to just start moving it around, breaking it up. Break up. If you've got a pack of ground meat that you're browning in a skillet, you want to break it up as you cook it, stir it, move it around. Hey, I just used another cooking verb there, if you're browning something. We use this with beef, especially ground beef. If you brown it, then you cook it in a skillet and it turns brown. But you can also use it with any food referring to changing the color to brown. You don't want it to brown, but you want it to kind of start looking translucent. But back to break up. Outside of cooking, we use this term a lot with relationships. It's a verb. They broke up last month. That means they stopped dating. They're not seeing each other anymore. It's also a noun. The breakup was really hard on him. The next two words are generally used with this appliance or something similar, a blender. This is used to blend ingredients into a homogenous mixture. Blend. Blend some fruit for a smoothie. Blend up some tomatoes for a pasta sauce. And for those of you that need to take blending still further, you can use pulverize to reduce something to fine particles. Just by looking at it, you can't tell exactly what's in it because it's so thoroughly combined and broken down. Fun fact, pulvis is the Latin word for dust. So you're turning a solid into a dust by pulverizing it. Here, the chef is making watermelon juice. 
He doesn't want any chunks or fibers left. He wants the consistency to be super smooth. So then we're just gonna blend the shit out of it, pulverized as much as possible. When we combine ingredients, not only do we change how they look, we also change how they taste. Probably the most universal way to enhance the flavor of something across the world is salt. Salt. You've definitely used it as a noun, but native speakers use it as a verb, too. We're gonna salt them right now. Season is another fantastic word to talk about how you change the flavor of a dish. This usage is not connected to the noun. The four seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall, but to herbs, spices, and sauces that we use as seasonings. Herb in American English, flavor additives. Anything you use to change the flavor of what you're making. My mom always seasons vegetables with garlic powder. There, it's a verb. She seasons vegetables. She uses seasonings. Here the chef uses the passive voice. If you want scrambled eggs that are fluffy, moist, seasoned well, but have texture and structure and can stick to a fork. Seasoned well. The eggs have been seasoned well. The past participle here has the ed ending, seasoned. Seasoned well. Now when you want to use the noun form, we don't say, those are great seasons. We add ing and it is a regular count verb, meaning that we use an s at the ending to make it plural, that's a great seasoning. Seasoning singular or those are great seasonings. Recently, my husband David seasoned some pork with a dry rub. Gonna do a rub? Yeah, here's the rub. Mustard powder, coarse salt, hot pepper flakes, thyme, oregano, celery salt, onion powder, garlic powder, black pepper. Wow. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Did you hear all those seasonings he named? And if you're like me and you wanna get the balance of flavor just right, then you might adjust how you season your food. I'm constantly tasting as I cook, adding a little more of this or a little more of that. Adjust means to change. We need to adjust the seasonings or we need to adjust the acidity. You can also use it with temperature. For example, watch the pot and adjust the heat if needed. While there's definitely a science to cooking, I also love approaching it as an art. Everything doesn't have to be exact all the time. When you're cooking without measuring everything exactly, then you're just eyeballing the measurements. Eyeball, this means looking at an amount to get a general measurement. And this is a very flexible recipe. You can see I'm just sort of eyeballing these, some of these measurements. Eyeballing is estimating. Estimate to roughly calculate or judge the value, number, or quantity. I estimate that's about a teaspoon. It's not exact, but it's close enough. Another synonym is guess. To think or suppose something without being 100% certain. And a really fun one is the combination of guess plus estimate, and that's guesstimate. This word popped up in American English in the 1930s when statisticians used it to describe an estimate made without using adequate or complete information. Now you'll hear various forms of it. We have the verb guesstimate, guesstimating. We have guesstimate, the noun, and also guesstimation. If you're into this approach of cooking, you might say, let's go heavy with the cream, meaning let's put more than the recipe calls for. Go heavy with. You can go heavy with all this stuff, especially when you're using flour. You may also hear go heavy on instead of go heavy with. Now the opposite, to go light on. To go light on something is to use slightly less. Let's go light on the sugar in this recipe. One more way to talk about combining ingredients. You've probably used this one to reference a piece of clothing, coat. This is to cover or spread an enclosing layer. Chef Hyla uses coat in passive voice here to show us that all of the pieces of chopped onion need to be completely covered in the oil as it sautés. Make sure it gets coated with all the oil. Part three, let's look at words that show how we change the shape of something using something other than a knife, a special kitchen tool, gadget, or your bare hand. First, great. This sounds just like this word, great. And this is a verb that comes from a noun for the thing called a grater. 
You can get lots of small pieces or threads by grating something like cheese or potato. Could you grate some cheddar for the tacos? It also shows up as a phrasal verb to grate in. Notice the T here is a flap T linking the two words grate in. And then I'm gonna grate in my onion. If you love baking pastries or cookies, I bet you own some version of this, a rolling pin. You'll use this to flatten something, flatten. Notice that stop T, flat, mm, flatten. With a rolling pin, I began to flatten it. Also, flatten out. Kind of flatten it out a little bit. Remove, to take something away or off. First thing you want to do is remove the tip. Crush, a verb to compress or squeeze or squish. I'm just going to kind of crush it up a little bit, bruise it so the oils release. We use this verb another way. If you want to say that someone is doing an amazing job, doing so well, you could say, you crushed it or you're crushing that. Actually, my husband said this about a cake I recently made. The icing was unbelievable, so good, and he said, wow, you crushed that. We also use it this way. To have a crush on someone, that means you find the person attractive in a romantic way. He or she is your crush. You can have a crush on your crush, just don't crush your crush. Don't smash the person you like. Smash, to violently or forcefully break something into pieces. Smash two eggs together. My preferred egg cracking method is this Italian grandma style where you smash two eggs together and magically and mysteriously only one egg will crack. Crack, this can happen when you crush or smash something against something else. Crack is a verb and a noun. It's a line on the surface of something where it's split without breaking into separate parts. You can crack an egg, you can crack a nut, and then you'll use that crack to open it up. Pinch off, using your finger to sever or detach something from something else. Trying to use the edge of the shell to sort of pinch off that egg white that sort of hangs there. Juice, we all know this word as a noun, orange juice, apple juice, but have you used it as a verb to squeeze the liquid out of something? Got my trusty lemon squeezer. I'll just start juicing at least three of the limes. There's also this helpful tool for juicing. Take a guess as to what it's called. A juicer. Turns out there are an awful lot of different juicers out there. Spread out to open, arrange, or place something over an area like frosting a cake. Spread out the frosting into smooth, even layers. And this waffle batter, because it's thick, you do have to spread it out a little. Or if you're roasting vegetables, you want them to be in a single layer, then you're going to spread them out on the cooking sheet. Roasting another cooking verb. Something you do in the oven or over fire for vegetables or meat. You usually get a little color, a little browning on them when you cook this way. I just love roasted vegetables. You can also use it to describe yourself if you're really hot. Ugh, it's so hot. I'm just roasting. Scoop. I'm fairly certain that the noun came first here. A scoop or a scooper is a utensil like this, handle, deep bowl to remove something from a container, like an ice cream scoop. In a process known as verbing, the noun can also be used as a verb to scoop. I'm scooping some ice cream for us. Want a scoop? About a third of a cup, I would say. As a noun, we also use scoop to mean information. You may have heard the phrase, what's the scoop? That's like, what's going on? What's the information related to some topic that you're already addressing? What's the scoop? Pop. Very often, this is a noun, a light explosive sound, like when you pop the top off of a bottle of champagne, or when you hear your bones pop as you stretch. In the northern part of the U.S., saying, I'll have a pop, means I want a carbonated beverage like Coke or Pepsi. In other regions, they call that soda. But this word also pops up, or shows up, occurs as a verb. You get to where the bone and the joint are, and you can just pop it. Just pop it. Apply pressure until it pops, until it breaks. We also use this for, not hard to guess, popcorn. Is it done popping? What about plop? An object dropping into liquid or something soft landing on something hard. 
gonna plop some of our chicken mixture on top of there. Plop. The final group here deals with vocabulary for changing the temperature of something. We already went over roast and brown. I don't know how many recipes I followed where this is step one, preheat. This is to heat something like an oven or a grill or a skillet to a designated temperature before using it for cooking. And we're just gonna follow my method for cooking scrambled eggs, which is by preheating a pan on medium heat, not too high, not too low. Following preheat, you'll likely see this word later in a recipe, bake. To cook food using dry heat without direct exposure to a flame. To specify a temperature and duration, we say bake at degrees for minutes. Done in the oven, just like roasting, we use this verb for things like casseroles and cakes. Just baked it at 375, cold oven, flipped it. Flip to turn to another side. We also have crisp, to give something a crunchy surface by baking, grilling, frying, so on. You wanna crisp the edges of the bacon, or bake the casserole until the top is lightly crisped. Okay, let's go in the opposite direction now. Cool, this is to bring the temperature down. But we're gonna let this cool for about five minutes before. That usually just means to remove from heat, not necessarily to put it in the refrigerator. And similar, cool off. It's cooled off enough to try it. Turn the temperature down even more and you get to freeze. This is how we turn water into ice or to store food at a very low temperature in order to preserve it. Water, in case you didn't know, freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Here the chef is showing us how to make an enchilada casserole to store in the freezer for later. And if you were gonna freeze this, you would just put the cheese on, cover it with some foil, and stick it in the freezer. And then you can bake it in the oven. Uh, you don't need to thaw it. Thaw it, the opposite of freeze, to bring something frozen back to a warmer temperature, room temperature. Uh, you don't need to thaw it. There are several ways to thaw frozen food. Leave it on the counter until it comes room temperature, or if you don't have a lot of time, a very American way to do this is to stick it in the microwave. Honestly, what I usually do is stick it in the microwave for like five minutes, because everything's already cooked. You're just trying to get the cheese to melt. Melt. To make something a liquid by applying heat, the opposite of freeze, where you take a liquid and make it a solid. Melt butter, melt chocolate, melt cheese. Simmer. This is to stay just below the boiling point when being heated. If you simmer soup on the stove, the steam is rising from the surface of it, and there may be little bubbles, but there aren't large bubbles making it roll. It's not a rolling boil. This is what we call it when a liquid is fully boiling. It can't get hotter. Boil. The boiling point in Fahrenheit is 212 degrees, so simmering is just a little under that you want to make sure that your stock is simmering as you add it to the rice. As you boil or simmer a liquid, the vapor that rises from the surface is called steam. And this is also a verb, another way of cooking something. Here's an example of a steaming pot. The water boils at the bottom of the pot, then the food rests in the upper pot and the steam comes up through the holes to cook it. This is baby spinach and what I did what I did was I steamed it in the microwave for 30 seconds. And one more verb related to hot liquid, steep. This is when you pour hot water or liquid over your ingredients and let them sit. Over time, the food flavors the liquid. I steep my tea for about five minutes. This weekend, I made a mushroom pot pie, it was so good, that called for steeping dried porcini mushrooms. And I have mint that I'm just going to steep in it once it's done. Remember this clip? You don't want it to brown, but you want it to kind of start looking translucent. Here, Hyla is sauteing rice. Saute is to cook food quickly with a little bit of fat over a relatively high heat. Sauteing is often done in a skillet so that you can easily control the temperature and easily stir to keep the food from burning. Broil. 
Now this is something that when I do it, I often accidentally burn my food. So this is when you expose food to direct very high heat in the oven. Most American ovens have a broil setting that's about 500 to 550 degrees. The upper heating element comes on and you put your food just below it. And if you're like me, you should not walk away from that oven. You should watch it every second because it can get really brown really fast. And then the next thing you know it, it's burnt and you're throwing it out. Now let's go back to David to learn a few more verbs. Gonna grill that, David? Yep, I'm gonna be smoked for about seven hours. You're not searing it first? Nope, doesn't need it. Grill is when you use one of these to provide direct heat to what you're cooking. A great way to cook during the hot summer when you don't want your kitchen to get even hotter. I asked if he was gonna sear it first. If you sear something, you apply a really strong heat to the surface of it to burn it a little bit. This can help lock in the juices when you're cooking meat. David said he didn't need to sear it, but he was gonna smoke it. When you smoke something, you expose it not just to heat, but smoke to flavor the meat. This is how he does it. A couple wood chunks to give it some smoke. then the meat has a fat cap on the bottom. So you put that down against the hot coals to kind of keep it protected from cooking too fast. And it goes opposite the coals. Grilling is really usually about direct heat. So the meat being right over top of the coals. Barbecue is more indirect heat. So the smoke is gonna kind of waft around past it. And then you'll see the smoke kind of like pass over to that side and the air kind of starts to go like this because one side is cold, one side is hot. So you can smoke meat in a smoker, but you can also smoke a cigarette. Now I don't eat meat, but everyone really liked that smoked pork. And I would say it was not just smoked, but it ended up a little bit charred. Char, that's beyond searing when the outside gets really burnt and blackened. And to wrap up this list, let's go with the safest way to end any cooking activity, turn off. Turn off the heat, turn down the heat, lower the heat, bring down the heat. Turn off as a noun is something that you don't like. For example, the smell of fish sauce is a turn off, it kills my appetite. It can also carry a sexual connotation. If a guy brags a lot, that's a major turn off for me. If you turn off the heat, then you kill the heat. At that point, you're going to kill the heat. Kill. Completely stop something. We can say kill the heat, kill the music, kill the engine, and so on. Okay, I want everyone watching this to put in the comments, what is your favorite thing to cook? And better yet, if you can find a video on YouTube of someone making it, paste that link in too. I love to see what people make and eat. And I'm also pretty hungry right now, so there's that. Thanks for sticking with me. I love teaching English and I make new videos every week. Be sure to subscribe with notifications on so you never miss a lesson and keep your learning going right now with this video. That's it and thanks so much for using Rachel's English.